The scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. <clears throat> and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you <clears throat> and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to them again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the word of God. Good morning, first of Anne. It's great to be with you on this Memorial Day weekend, on this Pentecost Sunday. Uh, thank you for having me, allowing me to, to preach here. Um, Jake, thank you for the lovely introduction, uh, but it's dangerous to introduce somebody to their home field crowd. Uh, as he was introducing me, I thought, you know, I, I sound pretty impressive when you list out all those accolades, right? Uh, but the problem is there are people in this room that know me. And they know that I'm not quite that impressive. And the reason, of course, the introduction sounds impressive is because it's a highlight reel, right? It's things I'm proud of. I'm glad for people to know about in my life. Now, if Jake had gotten a hold of, on the other hand, some of the worst things I've ever done, just the, the, the most despicable, shameful, sinful things I've done, and he got up here and began reading them, I guarantee you I'd be the first one out of the room. Or even worse, if they had footage and can show the sins I've given into, the wicked deeds that I've done, the cruel things that I've allowed to escape my lips, even worse, the things I've thought, and it was displayed up here. Now, what if it wasn't my low light reel, but yours that was playing up there? You know, what I would be thinking about is, where's the furthest place away I could move to? These the reason I bring this up, too, is because I want to explain my approach to today's passage. There's a way to approach this passage that is good and useful, but it kind of misses the main point of the conflict in this passage. There's a way to approach this text and just to kind of think, uh, well, hey, this is great. This is about temptation. Uh, I can get some tips. I can get some tricks. I can uh, have a how-to manual and a bit of a model for how to deal with the sin and the temptation that I encounter. And, and when we approach uh, the text in that way, uh, I, I think we miss the main important thrust of the passage. Be because in this text and in this conflict that we see in this passage, and indeed in our own battle with sin, what we need most isn't some tips and tricks, isn't some life hacks of how to deal with temptation. What we need in our battle against sin is a Savior. We need someone to deliver us from the wickedness, from the evil that we've already committed, to break the bondage of sin and death that reigns over us. We need a champion to overcome the evil one. 
And I, I use that word champion intentionally. I, I, I use it kind of in the old-fashioned way. Uh, you, you know, nowadays it can mean just, you know, someone who wins. I'm very tempted to mention the Georgia Bulldogs right now, but I'll resist that temptation. <laughs> but, but there's an older meaning to champion, and it, 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 the older meaning to champion is one who fights as a representative of others. The great biblical illustration we have of this concept of a champion comes from David and Goliath, a, a story we've all grown up hearing, right? And my boys love the story of David and Goliath, not always for the right reasons. Uh, they want to be Goliath in the story. We're, we're working on that, you know, just… <laughs> The temptation to be somebody who is big and mean and can get away with it is just a little too much for them at four years old right now. But, but in, the, in the story of David and Goliath, you have Goliath as a champion of the Philistines, right? He, he's calling out and taunting the Israelites and saying, hey, there's no need for both these sides to do a battle. I'll come out and represent the Philistines. You send out your man against me. And we'll, I'll fight on behalf of the Philistines, and you fight on behalf of the Israelites, and then whoever wins that wins the match, right? And David comes out as a champion of the people of Israel to defend God and His name, and slays the giant and cuts off his head securing for the Israelites the victory. We have in this passage another kind of battle. We have in this passage another kind of conflict. And, and, and I want you to see, if you, if you get nothing else from this message, that in this text, the Son of God is victorious over Satan. That, that's the good news. That, that, that is something to rejoice over. Christ succeeds where Adam fails. Christ succeeds where Israel failed. Christ succeeds where you fail. Christ succeeds where I fail. Because really, ever since the Garden of Eden, Satan has had a pretty successive track record, right? When I said, you know, what if the worst things you've done, what if your worst sins were projected up here, nobody was thinking, oh, that's fine with me. I haven't done anything wrong. No, no, we've each failed. We've each sinned. We've each turned away. And I, I, I bring that to the forefront because otherwise, as we approach this text and we look for tips and tricks, we'll begin thinking that, uh, you know, this might be a way for us to figure out how we can have something to offer from, to God. And if we begin to think of ourselves rather than Christ as the champion, uh, we begin to enter into a very discouraging and very depressing form of the Christian life because we fail, because we fall short, because we need a champion. We see in this text that the Son of God is victorious over Satan. That in itself is enough to bring us to a state of worship, to bring us to a state of praise, to bring us to a state of overwhelming joy. And I love the things that we've already sung together about our Savior, about the Spirit, and about our God. Now, I, I also use the term Son of God intentionally because it plays a crucial role in our text, doesn't it? Uh, I've 
I've been to Bible college and I've been to seminary and um, as a result of that, you get these great and deep insights into Scripture. And one of the things uh, they teach you there is that Matthew 4 comes immediately after Matthew 3. <laughs> and, and do you know what's said at the very end of Matthew 3? From God the Father as the... S- Spirit is descending in the form of a dove. These words are spoken. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The next voice that we have in Matthew chapter 4 says what? If you're the Son of God. And again, after the first temptation and the second temptation, if you are the Son of God. Central to to this whole spiritual conflict is the identity of Christ as the Son of God. We'll return to this theme a little bit later but I want you to understand the conflict that's going on. We see that the Son of God is victorious not only uh, against Satan, but the, the Son of God is victorious over sin. That is, in each of the temptations that are brought against him, he resists in obedience and submission to the Father while being controlled by the Spirit under the authority of the Word. There's this conflict, and in this conflict, we see big contrasts from chapter 3 to chapter 4. Timothy Keller says that in this contrast, in chapter 3, we have a voice from heaven. In chapter 4, we have a voice from hell. In chapter 3, we have the water of baptism. In chapter 4, we have the barren places. In chapter 3, we have a spiritual baptism. In chapter 4, we have a spiritual battle. It's that way in our lives, isn't it? That what immediately precedes the peak and pinnacle experiences are the dark and difficult times. Now, I I wanna give some context for the battle as well because um, I've I've been around churches enough to hear some things that bother me a little bit when people are exegeting this text and talking about it. It says, verse, chapter four, verse one, Jesus was led by the Spirit. So who's leading him? Spirit, right? It, it, It is the Spirit that leads him into this battle, not Satan. Now, it's also important that the Spirit leads him to the wilderness, to the deserted places, to be tempted. And then it says, he, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And some of us are hungry after 45 minutes in a service, right? Christ, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, is hungry. Now, I've had some people in their description of this passage say, well, you know, what's really happening here is uh, that Jesus is entering into a state of weakness. But that's only half true. It's only half true because Christ is also entering into a state of strength and a state of power. So the question is, for Christ, where does his power come from? Does it come from having a full belly, being surrounded by friends and companions? No. He he is separating himself from necessary physical nourishment that he might not be overly attached to the things of the world. He's separating himself from people as well. So one of the things we we see in this, that in in physical and in social weakness, Christ finds spiritual strength. 
We live in a society and a time when all our strength, and it seems like all our culture's strength, uh, finds consumption to be the means to strength. Some of us also have had the experience of recognizing that our righteousness, our holiness, is, is somewhat circumstantial. Uh, one of the things that happens uh, with my young kids is uh, there are, are times when they become more cruel, more mean, more wicked to one another. And, and as a parent, sometimes you're trying to figure out what's the reason? Why are they being so mean? Why are they hitting each other? Why are they fighting? Why are they pulling each other's hair? What's going on? And oftentimes, it comes right before snack or meal time, right? Some of you may have experienced the same thing, recognizing you get a little meaner, you get a little grumpier right before your blood sugar gets fixed, right? And so, what does that mean? That, that means for my boys and at times for us as well that our being nice, our being kind, our being upright is based on a, a set of physical circumstances. It, it can also be social circumstances, right? There are some of us who are, uh, as long as we are living in good community, as we're attending church well, we're, we're around good people, we can be halfway decent people. But if you get alone for a little while, if you become isolated after a bit, you, you become a, a quite a more wicked person. And, and counselors know this. As they're dealing with people who are, have addictions or difficulties, they say, okay, you know, you, you don't want to get into any really bad physical type of condition. You don't want to get isolated. You don't want to get overly hungry or needy in your physical state. But Christ's power is not a power that is based on His physical or His social circumstances. He abstains from food so that he may be sustained by the Word of God. He separates from community that he might commune with God. So in one sense, he is coming from a place of, yes, physical and social weakness, but on another sense, he's coming from a great spiritual place of power. And, and the method to Christ, of Christ's method of getting to, to that place of power, of preparing for spiritual battle, is one of separation from worldly things, even necessary and good worldly things. And we see that oftentimes our obedience is circumstantial as long as we're doing well physically, as long as we're surrounded by good people, we can do all right. But if you're alone, hungry, driving on 240, things might be a little different. Another thing we see in this is, is a contrast between Christ and Adam. Jesus famished in the desert succeeds where Adam, full in the garden, surrounded by edible fruit, fails to resist. We see in this first assault of Satan, it, it, it kind, of, kind of seems innocent at first, right? Turn these rocks into bread and starve them for 40 days seems innocent. You're, you're just providing a basic need. You're, you're using a, a spiritual power you have to meet a physical need. What's so wrong with that, right? But at its root, something deeper is going on. It, what's, what's at issue is whether Christ is sustained by the Spirit or by His stomach. Is He ruled by God or His gut? Is he satisfied by the word or by wheat? We experience this in our own lives as well. We've all got to overcome. We've all got to deal with these questions of what is going to sustain us. 
in our lives. In giving in to this temptation, it's a, a way of saying, you know, surely I deserve earthly pleasure, or at least earthly physical sustenance, right? It's the sin of self-indulgence. It's loving ourselves and the pleasures of this earth too much. In loving ourselves unduly and loving the pleasures of this world uh, too much, we, we see that it's a sin also of saying, God's Word's not enough. God's Word, again, is, is what is coming under attack here, remember? End of chapter 3, this is my beloved Son. Chapter 4, if you're the Son of God. Surely, if you're the son of God, God doesn't want you to starve. Sure, surely he doesn't want you to suffer unduly. Surely it's okay to provide for your own self and your own needs. The word of God isn't enough. We also need provision of our physical bodies. We see Christ rebuffs this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. He is sustained not by bread. He is filled not with bread, but he is sustained and filled with the word of God. Second temptation is, is kind of the opposite. One of the things I want you to realize is Satan doesn't care which way he pushes you off the road, right? Right? He doesn't care if he pulls you off to the left in a physical indulgence, or he doesn't care if he pulls you off to the right into self-righteousness and religious hypocrisy. After Jesus resists the temptation of living for the satisfaction of the flesh, the devil tries another approach. He says, well... It, 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 forgive me some embellishment here, but it's as though he says, well, you certainly aren't carnal. You know, you're, you're right to dismiss the physical for the spiritual. My, you're such a spiritual person. You know what would prove your spirituality? Let's go to the middle of the holy city. Let's go to the top of the temple. And then you can prove your spirituality. You can prove your spirituality by sacrificing yourself physically. Cast yourself from the pinnacle of the temple in the middle of the holy city in order to demonstrate your unwavering belief in the Scriptures. That would prove you're the Son of God, right? And it, it would prove it not only to yourself but to all these witnesses. All, all these people around the temple mount would see and know that you're the Son of God. Of course, this isn't a true spirituality, right? It's quite the opposite. It's a hellish, pharisaical, self-righteous act of pride. But it comes disguised as a godly act. It comes dressed in religious garments. It comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing. These are the type of sins we as good church-fearing folks need to be especially on the alert for. Uh, this is a, a kind of presumptive sin. It, it says, surely I deserve a heavenly sign. Or surely others deserve a heavenly sign to prove who I am. It's a sin of self-righteousness. Ultimately, it is putting our faith in ourselves rather than in God. And again, it's showing that God's Word isn't enough. It's not enough that the Father has said, you are my son. It's got to be proved. It's got to be demonstrated by a sign in front of a lot of 
people. I need validation. And both these first two assaults are, again, attacking that key thing, what God has just immediately beforehand said, this is my beloved son. He does that in the Garden of Eden as well, doesn't he? Did God really say? Surely you will not die. Satan, although he is crafty, is not very creative. He uses the same methods over and over again. He has nothing new or good in himself. He only has the ability to corrupt that which is good and that which is true. We see Christ again rebuffs it with Scripture. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. By the way, in this temptation also, Satan's using Scripture. He's, he's using it poorly. He's, he doesn't have great exegesis, but he's using Scripture. Christ uh, doesn't respond by, by correcting him. He, he responds again by quoting another Scripture. But one of the things this shows us is we ought to be very careful in how we study and understand Scripture. Eric Alexander, the great Scottish preacher, uh, with his rolling Scottish brogue, as he exegeted this passage, uh, said something that really uh, convicted me. He said, I'm paraphrasing here, that there are two ways to approach Scripture. One way is when you approach Scripture, you're looking for a way to excuse yourself to do what you want to do. You're looking for, uh, in Scripture, for excuses so that you can do what you want to do. The other way to approach Scripture is to read it in order to find out what your heavenly Father wants you to do. Christ in His approach to Scripture is looking for how He can obey and serve and worship and honor His Father. What's your approach when you read Scripture? What are you looking for? What are you trying to see there? Jesus responds you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. By the way, we, we mentioned that Jesus here is succeeding where Adam failed. He's also succeeding where Israel failed. This passage, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, happens in the wilderness after Israel was taken out of Egypt. And it happens as the people start grumbling saying, we don't have water. God can't provide for us in this desert place. Moses, why'd he bring us out here to kill us? The people tested God by their lack of faith in his provision. Christ here relies wholly and completely upon his Father. We have then the third assault The third assault comes in this form. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Satan always tries to tempt us with good things, doesn't he? It, it, because quite frankly, is it a good thing for all nations and their glory to be under Christ and His rule and authority. Well, certainly that's a good thing, isn't it? That's what Revelation 21 tells us, isn't it? There's coming a time when the nations of the world in their glory will be worshiping the Son of God. That's a wonderful thing. That's what Satan's offering here. He's offering a shortcut to it, though, isn't he? He's offering a shortcut without the cross. He 
He's offering the reward without the suffering. The reward of obedience without the suffering of obedience. And, and this, this comes as a type of sin that says, you know, surely I deserve glory without having to suffer. It's the sin of self-exaltation to put our hope in gaining glory for ourselves at its root, it's right out pride, isn't it? While the other two temptations were to say that the Word of God is not enough, this assault is more direct, and it says God Himself is not enough. I want the rewards of God, but I don't necessarily want God. He's just a means to an end. Take his rewards while rejecting him. And by the way, this this would have been a sham if Christ had taken it. He would have received the temporary glory of the nations and given up the eternal glory of all nations. But that's not what he focuses on. What what he focuses on is it doesn't matter what the rewards are. It doesn't matter what the cost is. The important thing is the worship and the service of God. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Christ here commits to the glory of God even what involves his suffering. God is worthy of the glory of the suffering of his people. Now, I want to talk about us a little bit. First and and foremost, I I want you to understand that Christ is the victor. Christ is the champion because otherwise you're going to be fighting battles that you're going to lose. And number two, you're going to be fighting battles that Christ has already won. Christ has defeated the evil one. Christ has overcome not only sin but death. We're skipping ahead to the cross and the resurrection, right? Here we see him overcome the evil one. Here we see him resist sin. Here we see that he is not one to be bound by sin. Later on in the cross and the resurrection, we see that he is not bound by the consequence of sin. He takes it on temporarily on our behalf. He enters under the yoke of death so that he might break the yoke and we no longer carry it. Christ is victorious. Um, This is a passage we could spend days, months, or years on studying, and so I've had to be selective. But one of the things I want to emphasize is um, we, we could, you know, move ahead to second level things and say the great temptation of your life is going to be whether or not you believe that you are who God says you are. But I think what we need to get sorted before that is whether or not you believe Jesus is who God says he is. That's the first thing we've got to get right. And the great temptation in your life is to not believe or not to act as though Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Every assault and temptation that you deal with has that as its root. And if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has overcome the evil one, you're going to be tempted to live as though God does not deserve all worship and glory and obedience. The great temptation for you is also the same as the great temptation that comes upon Christ. We have the temptation to live your life as though Christ is not the Son of God by living for physical earthly comforts. I 
That's a hard one to talk about, isn't it? To live as though this world and the pleasures and joys is all that there is. Another way we can live as though Jesus Christ isn't the Son of God is by living a self-righteous life. If Jesus Christ isn't the Son of God, and if Jesus Christ hasn't earned the victory, well, then I've got to do some things to impress God, to earn my spot, to move up the ranks, to impress the people around me. Thirdly, we can live as though the great, we can live as though Jesus Christ isn't the Son of God by seeking our glory instead of God's glory. To find our our pleasure in self-exaltation rather than lifting up Christ, showing Him forth as the Savior, showing Him forth as the victor, showing Him forth as the love of the Father displayed to us. Our great encouragement is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believe it. He has defeated the evil one. He has overcome both sin and death. Um, The great thing about little kids is is they ask honest questions. And... uh, they're always thinking, they're always processing. And one of my sons came to me and said, Daddy, if God and Goliath fought, who would win? So that's a great question, right? Goliath's pretty big, he's pretty mean. He said, son, I got news. They already fought. God already won. Through his servant David. But some of us are living like that now. We're we're kind of wondering, well, man, who who wins? Is it Satan or God? Our champion has already won. Our champion has already defeated the enemy. And the great news is, if you have Christ as your champion, his victory is our victory. He is our champion, church. He earns what we cannot. He conquers where we have failed. Thirdly, Jesus Christ, as as the Son of God, shows us that the Christian's path to victory is completely different than the world's methods. I I think the church has wasted a great deal of energy and focus and strength in trying to pursue victory outside of Christ's prescribed means. We, We see in this passage that Christ's victory is brought about through self denial through humility, through dependence, and through death to self. These are our weapons. This is the path that Christ has forged for us. Walk in it. And because of Christ's great work for us, we have hope. Because we have a champion who has overcome, we can face the future boldly. And Scripture confirms this. Just hear these words of Scripture and to think how Christ, as your victor, brings us the victory. Colossians 2.15, when He had disarmed the rulers and authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him that is Christ. Romans 16.20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, the grace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God's going to use his church to crush Satan because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news and hope for sinners. Revelation 12, 10 through 20. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been cast down. He accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that Christ, under the guidance of your spirit, in submission to your word, in complete dependence upon your will, O Father, has vanquished our enemy, has conquered our foe. Lord, may we live in light of the victory he has won. May we live as though he is our champion, not fighting over again the victories that he has won. Lord, until we see that victory fully manifest in the new kingdom, in the new heavens and in the new earth, may we be faithful to the one who has overcome And may we bring him honor and glory. Lord, may we live as though you are worthy of the glory of our suffering, just as Christ has showed us in his great victory over the evil one. Until he comes, may we be faithful and fruitful in walking in the victory that Christ has manifest. To you, O Lord, be all glory and honor and praise, now and forevermore. Amen.